Matthew 26, verse 41. And the word of the Lord says, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh, it is weak. You may be seated in the presence of our life-changing king. And what's his name? His name is Jesus. There's nobody like him. This morning, we want to change courses. We uh, have been dealing with Christian discipleship, and the Lord put on my heart, even as we read the text this morning, we want to theme this as fighting temptations. Fighting temptations. As I was closing out the service last Sunday, after Pastor D preached, powerful preaching, I might add, she read a particular text in Revelations that stood out to me. And the Holy Spirit let me know that it was a word for the house and also, I believe, for the body of Christ in this season. Um, She read the scripture from Revelations, and John the Revelator was writing to the church of Philadelphia. And he commends them, and he writes in Revelations, the third chapter, verse number 10. He says, because thou hast kept my the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now, in particular, when I read this text, and even when I referenced it last week, I had to just go back and study it to make sure that it was in context. In particular, This text is not only speaking of the many hours and seasons of temptation we experience, but the ultimate reference here is the great tribulation period, where faithful believers shall not even be here to experience it. Can the church say amen? In Psalms, the 95th division, verse number 8, it says, Harden not your heart as in the provocation." And as in the day of temptation, in the wilderness, you see it says day of temptation. Before it said the hour of temptation. And then now here it speaks of the day of temptation. And so really when it's speaking of that, it's making reference to a period or a season of temptation. What I'm saying to you by the Holy Ghost is that I discern that this is an hour, not the hour, not the tribulation period, but an hour, a day of temptation or a period or a season of temptation. The scripture says, watch or be prayerful, be prayerful, watch and pray, watch and pray. Somebody say, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. And so we have to discern the season. We must recognize the season. Those that are watching via Facebook and those that were watching on the replay, we must discern the season, recognize the season as an hour of temptation. We must be watchful and prayerful in the season. I'm reminded of the children of Issachar. In 1 Chronicles, the 12th chapter, verse number 32, this is what the word says. From the tribe of Issachar, there were 200 leaders of the tribe with their relatives. And all these men understood the signs of the time and knew the best course for Israel to take. So they were one tribe. They were from the tribe of Issachar, but they, 200 of them. All of them, they discern which course that Israel ought to take. Isn't that something? So they all had a spirit of discernment on them. They all recognized the season often on what course Israel ought to take. And I believe that God is sharpening our discernment in this season and giving us a word to let us know that we need to be watchful and prayerful in this season 
It's not that we ought not be watchful and prayerful in all season, but in particular, we need to be watchful and prayerful in this season, meaning we need to intensify our discernment, intensify our watching, intensify our praying during this season because in certain seasons you're more susceptible. There are certain seasons we're more susceptible to the plots and the ploys and the tricks and the schemes of the enemy. And so the Holy Spirit, how many have the Holy Spirit on the inside? The Holy Spirit, he teaches us and guides us and leads us and directs us. He is the spirit of truth. How do we stay away from the spirit of error? By allowing the spirit of truth to reign on the inside, to lead us, to guide us, to direct us. We have the spirit of truth. So therefore, we're not ignorant concerning the devices of the enemy. Second Corinthians says that the enemy would not, would not have an advantage of, uh, over us or outwit us. We are not ignorant concerning his devices. Now, that word devices, somebody say devices, is the Greek word noemus, which means plots and ploys and schemes. It is a perception of evil purposes. So we're not ignorant, but we perceive the enemy's doings, the enemy's goings. We even perceive the spirit of the age. We perceive what's going on in the airways, what's going on in the media, what's going on in the community, what's going on in the African-American community, what's going on with our young people. We perceive, we have a perception of the evil purposes and the plots and the schemes that the enemy, the enemy, somebody say the enemy, wants to do, but the Lord will lift up a standard against him. The Lord will speak to his people and tell us to be watchmen, to stand upon the wall, to stand upon our watch, to see what he would say to us that we may be able to answer when those times comes. Can the church say amen? How many know there is a devil? Ephesians, the sixth chapter, verse number 11, says that we ought to stand against the wiles of the devil. Y'all see that? Wiles. That word wiles in the Greek is methodias. It is the methods. It is the strategies. It is the tricks and the schemes of the devil. The Bible says that we ought to stand against the wiles, against the strategies, against the methods, against the schemes of the devil. But you got to know how to stand. It ain't just standing up. It's knowing how to stand. It is your spiritual disposition. Just because you stand up don't mean you're standing against the enemy. You got to stand. It's a spiritual posture. It is having revelation. It's knowing who you are and whose you are. It's having a position, knowing your position in Christ. It's because of Christ we have the victory. It's because of him that we have overcome the world. He has already caused us to triumph over the enemy. And so our authority comes from our revelation of who he is and who we are in him. Can the church say amen? amen. You know, you know, not only do we have to deal with the enemy, but the spirit of the enemy, the God of this world, the spirit of the enemy. You know, the devil is one. I ain't but one devil. But then, you know, there are demons. And there are principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. And they operate and manifest themselves through people in the earth. How many understand what I'm talking about? And there are, there are, there are rank, and, 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 and rank and authority in the kingdom of darkness. And the devil being at the top of that hierarchy. And so we have to understand that there is a war going on. And we are in spiritual warfare whether we realize it or not. And when the enemy starts knocking you upside the head and you start looking at the person next to you, you need to realize what's going on in the realm of the spirit for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God. So we got to know what's going on. 
We got to get our head out of the sand and we need to lift up our heads and be able to see what is going on in this world. Because I'm telling you, the enemy is cunning, he's crafty, and there is a spirit of the age that's trying to infiltrate the church and trying to snuff the church out and trying to kill the church and trying to cause people to fall away and cause people not to want to do the things of God and cause people to say it doesn't take that much and we ain't got to do all that. But how many of you know the devil is a liar? The devil is a liar because the church is alive and it is a well. It is well. Arise, Pastor D said. The Bible calls it the God of this world, him, the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air that is in the world. It is so pervasive and it's operating through other people. So you have the enemy and then you have the enemy working through other people. But we also got to deal with the enemy that's in the inner me. Because you got a wild spirit on the inside of you. Not just, not just me, not just you, Mike, but all y'all, you got a wild spirit on the inside. No matter how meek and mild you are, there is a wild spirit that wants to do its own thing, make its own way. It does not want to submit to the law of God. It is not submissive. It does not behave. It wants to act up. It wants to do its own thing. And you want to go this way, and it says, no, let's go that way. And you want to go up, it says, no, let's go down. You want to go forward, that thing say, no, let's go backwards. You say, no, that thing say, yes, and please. Can the church say amen? amen? So you got an enemy on the inside of you that participates with the spirit of the enemy. It's the old man. It's the flesh. It's akin to the enemy. <laughs> Somebody say, well, was that the flesh or the devil? It doesn't matter. They the same. I don't know if it was the devil or the flesh. It doesn't matter. They're the same. It is the self. Now, materially, they're not the same, but y'all know what I'm saying. And so we got to deal with that enemy in the inner me, that wild joker on the inside. Paul, he was perplexed with it, man. Paul was writing poetry in the scripture, he, going back and forth. You didn't know what he was talking about. Paul said, man, 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 when I, oh, my goodness. He said, well, you know, when I go to do good, when he, in his final analysis, he said, when I go to do good, all I know is evil is present with me. It's right there. I'm going to do good, and evil says no. You in church thinking the wrong thing. My God. You went to do something good, and you saw something caught your eye, and you end up doing something bad when you went to do something good. I intended to have a good, pleasant conversation with you. But by the end of that thing, we fussing and fight. When you went to do good, evil was right there present with you. I just went to look and I ended up on the dance floor. Oh, man, I better stop right there. Because I might... If I keep going, I'll just go ahead and finish the night. We don't want to finish the night, huh? But how many know it's been like this from the beginning? After Adam sinned. From the beginning, in Genesis, the sixth chapter, verse 5 through 8. Let's read that. Genesis, the fifth chapter. And this is what God says. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. My God. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on earth and it grieved him at his heart. It broke his heart that he was looking down and everything they were thinking, imagining to do was evil, constant and continually. God said, you won't even think about me. Think about good, just constantly evil, continually. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air for it repentance me that it made him. We know about the flood, the flood, right? But God found or Noah found grace in the eyes 
of the Lord. Thank God for grace. Boy, oh boy, boy, that's a, that was a preview of a coming attraction. My goodness. God said, you deserve death. But Noah found grace. Preview of a coming attraction. How many thank God for his grace? His amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Y'all know how sweet that sound is. Well, in that grace, when you hear grace, doesn't that thing sound sweet? Boy, I thank God for his mercy and his grace. It sounds so sweet. How sweet the sound. Boy, those of us who need it, all of us need it. How sweet the sound. Thank God for his grace. His all-sufficient grace is because of his grace and his mercy we're not consumed. Jeremiah, the 18th chapter. Y'all don't mind going through the scripture, do you? Verse 11. This is what Jeremiah, now that was back in Genesis. God destroyed the earth, but Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord, and his family was saved, and there was a, a restart. Now we're at Jeremiah. This is many, many years later. I don't know exactly how many. And this is what God says. Now, therefore, go to, speak to the men of Judah, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you and devise a device against you. Return ye now, every one, from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. Amend your ways. Make your ways good. This is what they say in verse 12. And they said, There is no hope, but we will walk after our own devices. And we will, everyone, do the imaginations of his evil heart. The imaginations of his evil heart. They said, every one of us, we're going to do what's in our heart. We're going to do exactly what we want to do. God's telling them to repent and return. And they said, no, stop wasting your breath. This is what, this is what it says in the New Living's translation, verse 11. Therefore, Jeremiah, go and warn all Judah and Jerusalem. Say to them, this is what the Lord says. I am planning disaster for you instead of good. So turn from your evil ways, each of you, and do what is right. But the people replied, don't waste your breath. <laughs> this is what they tell the prophet. Don't waste your breath. We will continue to live as we want to stubbornly following our own evil desires. So get away from here with all that stuff. We want to do what we want to do. I believe that we are in a season like that. And we may not be saying that with our mouth, but in our attitude and in our hearts. Now, I know the many of you, I might be preaching to the choir, and y'all here today say, Pastor, well, we're here today. We're here, but, but I'm talking about the spirit of the age and the people that you deal with on a regular basis. And perhaps some of this seed in your own heart. Well, you're here, but you're not all the way here. Your body is here, but your mind is on the other side of town. You got one foot in the church and then the other foot on a banana peel. And we're slipping and we're sliding. And we might come to church this week, but then again, we might not. It depends on how I feel. I decided 10 o'clock, we got to be there at 11 o'clock because there is a spirit in this age that's causing people to say it's not so important. The Bible calls it perilous times. It's times where people are proud and boastful and arrogant and lovers of themselves more than lovers of God, hating, covetousness, backbiting, and all the like. The Bible says that we're living in perilous times. These are those times. When people start talking crazy, you don't have to wonder what's going on. These are perilous times. They are products of the age. 
And so we have to stand up and arise as the church of the living God and be the people that God has called us to be in this dark world. We got to shine the light. Somebody say shine the light. Arise and shine. Thy light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon thee. Can the church give him a praise right there? So temptation, y'all say fighting temptation. Yep, 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 I'm talking about that. I just got to get you there because you got to understand it in context. Because I believe we're in this season, in this hour, in this day, and temptation is always here. But there are times, as I said before, when it's more intensified and we are more susceptible than other times. It's the hour of temptation. And the Bible, and the Bible speaks of temptation in many different facets in many different ways in many different varieties it speaks of temptation so I wanted to make sure that when I heard the Lord said this is the hour of temptation what does that mean and so as I began to study the scripture I found that temptation it means several different things the Bible says count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations but it means different. Diverse means different vari varieties and types of temptations. There are many different types of temptation. Can the church say amen? amen? So we find in Matthew, the sixth chapter, verse number 13, we find Jesus saying, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So we see in the Lord's Prayer or the disciples' prayer, Jesus says, pray and lead us not into temptation. Now, we know that God doesn't tempt with evil, neither does he tempt any man. So he can't be talking about sin. The God don't lead us into sin. He's talking about afflictions or trials. And so he's speaking here of Instead, leading us in the path of righteousness. Don't lead us into temptation, but deliver us from this evil. Lead us in the path of righteousness. That, that's what's being said. So it's speaking of a temptation uh, as a trial, or it's speaking of it as providence. That's what it's speaking of, as trials and providence. As trials, don't lead us into this evil, lead us into the path of righteousness. Ordain our path. Lead us in the right way. So it's speaking of trials, temptations as trials and providence. He can guide our step in such a way where we can avoid the people and the places that can tempt us. That's what it's talking about. We ask our Father to take providential charge of us to keep us out of some situations where the evil one can tempt us. That's what it's saying in context, because I know y'all didn't take the time to look up what it meant, so I did it for you. <laughs> Somebody say labor in the doctrine. Amen. Amen. Luke, the fourth chapter, verse number 13, it says this, and when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. Again, temptation as trial. Y'all remember when the enemy came to Jesus, he said, turn this this stone into bread, and Jesus said that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out the mouth of God. He tempted him three times, and then he left him, it said, for a season. You know what a season is? It's a period of time. How long? We don't know exactly. But it says that the enemy, he comes and he tries and tempts us, and then he leaves us alone for a season until he comes back. It ain't one and done. How many ever experienced a time where you were in a season where you felt like you were being tempted, uh, tempted and that thing was intensified and then it seemed like it ceased or it calmed down and then you found yourself in another one later on? And how many have ever been in one situation you've been tempted and it was intensified and then it slowed down and then something else came right up behind it and then that slowed down and then some up came up right behind it or sometimes something didn't slow down, something came up right up on it. 
You were in the middle of one and something else came up on top of that and then something else came up on top of that. That's tribulations. So you've been tempted and now you got tribulation. Three times the trouble. Are y'all hearing me this morning? Luke, the eighth chapter, verse 13, it says, They own the rock, are they, which, when they hear, receive the word with joy. These have no root, for which for a while believe, and in the time of temptation fall away. In the time of temptation fall away. So you see, it's a period. It's a window. It's a time or season. But he says this kind of temptation, it comes, and if you're not careful, this type of temptation will cause you to fall away. See, there is a type of temptation that's trials. Then there's another type of temptation. It's not for just trials, but it is strong enough to get you into the realm of unbelief to where you don't even trust God no more. Because the thing was so strong, it was so bad that it got you to questioning whether God is good. Where you experienced problems or trials and they were so strong that you wonder if God was watching you. If God even cared. Causing you, your faith to be affected in such a way to where you are not even sure if you believe. These are temptations that tries to get us to fall away. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, verse 5 through 6, it says, But with many of them God was not pleased, talking about the children of Israel, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. They were overthrown in the wilderness. I want y'all to hear me by the spirit. They were overthrown in the wilderness. They were in their period, their season where they were being tempted. You know, they murmured and complained and said all manners of evil. And, and, and some of them were overthrown. In fact, most of them were overthrown in the wilderness. Bible says that he saved, you know, Joshua and Caleb. And, and at a certain point, he says, y'all ain't going to ever see the promised land. Because it got so bad that the way they didn't even trust God, they said, let us go back to Egypt to get those leeks and onions. They wanted to go back to taskmasters when God had pulled them out of Egypt into the wilderness on their way to the promised land. And they longed for Egypt. They wanted the world, even though they were with God. Then they go through these trials. Oh, you brought us out here to die. Don't you know the God that opened the Red Sea can feed you? Don't you know the God that opened the Red Sea can give you water to drink? Don't you know the God that opened the Red Sea can provide everything? Don't you know that the God that delivered you out of the stuff that you were in can deliver you in the situation that you're in now? Well, why are we going to get in a tough trial and then lose our faith and think that God is not good? Who have bewitched you that you would err from the truth? Listen here. And I tell you, I might be crazy, but I'm never going to lose my faith in God. You might be crazy, but don't ever lose your... You know, some of us, we all get a little crazy, but don't ever get it twisted. Don't ever get it twisted. We better know that the Lord, he is God, and he hath made us and not we ourselves. And we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. You better know that God created everything and that God is the almighty. He is the omnipotent, the omnipresent, the omniscient one. He is great and greatly to be praised. And I will bless him and give him praise. And I will trust him whether I'm in the valley or on the mountaintop. I'll give him some praise. Because he's worthy of it. No matter what's going on in my life, I will give the Lord some praise because he's worthy of it no matter what my situation or my circumstances is. Somebody say he's so worthy. 
He's so worthy. So they were overthrown in the wilderness. And in this season, in this season, in this pandemic, don't be overthrown. People are falling away. They don't realize they've been overthrown. They've gone through a wilderness and they've been overthrown in the wilderness. And because life continues to go on, don't mean that you're right with God and you're in your right place. You need to make sure that you haven't been overthrown in this pandemic wilderness. I know I'm talking right in here today. My God. In Galatians, the fourth chapter, verse 14. This is the Apostle Paul. He says, and my temptation was in my flesh, ye despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. He said in, in the pr proceeding verse, he said, you know, it, it was a time where if, if, if you could have plucked out your own eye, you would have given it to me. And what he was saying, he said, you didn't reject me in my temptation. He was speaking of some sickness. In other words, he said, you could have rejected me in this time, he said, but you received me. You received me. So temptation is, is as it's as sickness in the scripture. There are times where the Bible speaks of temptation as sickness. And the challenge with sickness is there's a temptation in sickness. Y'all got to hear me. There's a temptation in sickness where others are tempted and you are too. Other people are tempted to reject you. When they should be caring for you. Some people say, you know what? He did something wrong. That's why he going through what he's going through. Like they did Job. They rejected Job. And Job said, listen here. Listen. Job did not, did not ascribe that sickness to God. Even though God allowed those things to happen to him, it was the enemy that afflicted him. And Job didn't foolishly charge God. And people will sometimes look on you and begin to despise what's going on in your life. And sometimes we're tempted to charge God foolishly. When we're sick, how many know that's a time of temptation? It believed that Paul might have been blind. It doesn't say it believed he might have been blind or had some other thing going on with him. But he had some sickness. He said, you didn't reject me. Is that what the scripture said? He said, you didn't reject me. You know, temptation as sickness. You know, I was down in Florida this week and celebrating my, my mother-in-law's birthday. And my mom was with us. And we were having a good time. And, you know, I heard about a 43-year-old superintendent that was down there. Super school is superintendent. So a young superintendent, you know, died from COVID. Then uh, one of... Uh, the guys that I grew with, grew up with, 47 years old, died from COVID. And so in this season, I, I, I want to share with you, you can't just take it for granted that you're just going to be here. Why? Because you're young. It's affecting everybody. But in this season, there's been some great division. And even in the body of Christ in the country about whether to wear masks or no masks. So you got the mask wear and the no mask wear. People don't think it's important. You got the vaccine folks and the no vaccine folks. Right, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You got the conspiracy folks and the no conspiracy folks. You know, they put something in this vaccine. You know, they got the mark of the beast up in there. You don't want to take it. What I'm saying is that we need the spirit of truth. So we're not deceived. And each one of us has to seek the heart of the Lord so we're not deceived in this time. we got to keep our eyes on Jesus and stay away from personal convictions, especially if you have a platform. Because your personal conviction, you can't put that on everybody else. You might feel as right as whatever, but you got to make sure that you are being wise and prudent and making sure you're not putting your personal conviction, even if you think what they're doing is foolish. And then we find in Matthew, the 26th chapter, because we're going to get in this thing on Wednesday night and also uh, after the millennials. But we're going to get into it on Wednesday night. Let me give you these scriptures 
And then we're going to jump on it because I hadn't even gotten to the part where y'all say, Pastor, how do I fight? How do I fight? Y'all know we teach in series, so you have to build up to it. Revelation, the third chapter, verse 10, it said, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. That's temptation as the tribulation period. And then my last scripture is our text today. And that's where we started. That's where we're going to end. It says in Matthew 26, verse 41, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh, it is weak. It's talking about temptation as sin. We're going to get into this on Wednesday night. Is that all right? Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Let us bow.